much of our work has not only addressed the science and technology in terms of what it's doing and where it can go, and certainly posing certain questions about where it should go, directively so, and perhaps where it shouldn't go, at least not yet. And the question of where it shouldn't go, at least not yet, is not so much directed back to the science, but more to the civic institutions that will engage that science in its various practices. This is much of my ongoing work with my good colleague, John Shook. And one of the things that we're very, very concerned about is the way that neuroscientific tools and technologies will be employed to define or create particular norms. I mean, certainly we see that happening in medicine. Uh, the idea of utilizing neuroscientific applications, for example, in neurology to define what is normal or abnormal with regard to structures and functions of the brain has, as you're aware, spread to at least some extent by intent to psychiatry. And there's an ongoing discourse of whether or not neuroscience and psychiatry are compatible and how much neuroscience figures into psychiatry. There have been calls, for example, to utilize a variety of criteria, many of them that are reliant upon the neurosciences for imaging and genetics and trying to understand the biological basis of mental illness so as to improve their prevention, diagnosis, and care. And of course, as you know, in this country as in others, there is something of a schism between our ability to diagnose and treat mental illness, and there are certainly some differences with regard to the equiparity of mental health care. Working with my colleague, Dr. Dan Stein, we've said that we have to appreciate the, the global burden of mental illness, and we call for no new neuroscience without neuroethics, but no neuroethics without an appreciation of a global neuroethics as relates to global mental health. And one of the issues that comes up when we're dealing with this global idea of neuroscience and technology is the asymmetries that occur with regard to the provision or access or use of these neuroscientific tools and techniques. It's something we need to appreciate, not only on a global scale, but also on a national scale. Now, I'm talking to you here in, in Los Angeles. and As you know, I come from Washington, DC. And as you can tell from my accent, I come from New York City. We have a homeless problem here in the United States. It's somewhat endemic. Individuals fall between the cracks economically and socially. And more than that, we have problems with regard to the provision of health care. We still continue to grapple whether or not health care represents a right, represents a privilege, how much is necessary, and how that should be compensated, supported, paid, and provided. With these cutting edge areas of neuroscience and technology, we have to ask the question who will get the goodies? Who will be treated? Who will not be treated? And if, in fact, we're using these tools and technology to define what is normal and abnormal, we're also then defining that line between what constitutes a treatment and what may constitute an enablement, optimization, enhancement. And if, in fact, we're defining these things in ways that provide norms for function, dysfunction, abnormality, what we regard to be viable or inviable, how will we then provide those necessary mechanisms to treat these things? Is it sensible to be able to assess and diagnose particular things that we cannot treat? This has been one of the ongoing debates about investigations of something like Alzheimer's dementia, where we're looking ever more closely at the causes, but there are still those who wring their hands and ask why we haven't developed more salient, more effective treatments. And even if we did develop those treatments, and certainly we know there are a number of different things we can do at very, very least to mitigate some of the signs and symptoms of neuropsychiatric conditions, we still must ask the question, who's going to get them? Do we target those individuals who may need them most, for example, uh, some construct of commutative justice? All of them? The homeless? Those who are uninsured? Or will it be that those who can afford it will, in fact, be provided these neuroscientific tools and techniques in the various aspects of medicine and even beyond that, in those domains where they can then acquire them personally and use them for wellness, enhancement, optimization, betterment? What happens, for example, to the schism between the haves and the have-nots? Now, when those haves are the neurologically capabilized and the have-nots are those that are not, what we do about that? Will we, in fact, appreciate that asymmetry and provide to those individuals who need it most, irrespective of whatever may be their social class or clade? Or, in fact, will we create a new elite? And what would that mean? And even if, in fact, we do that nationally, we recognize that there is going to be some equity and some equality in how these things are developed, provided, and accessed, what will we do globally? And so much of neuroscience and technology is the effect, result, and product of developed countries. What will be the relationship that exists between developed countries that have neuroscientific and technological capability, 
in developing countries and undeveloped countries that don't? What will be that relationship not only in terms of medical asymmetries, but also of performance capabilities, economic capabilities? And how will we regard those that don't have those things? And what will that mean for the level of treatment on a variety of levels, from the medical and physical all the way up to the economic and political? So I think one of the things that becomes important is to recognize that as the momentum of science and technology continues to gain steam, continues to increase in its scope, its depth, its capability and sophistication, we must sometimes take a step back and ask ourselves if, in fact, we are ready as societies, civic institutions, as perhaps a global citizenry, to be able to embrace that science and technology in definable ways that are good and very often that requires coming to the table in a discursive way, in a balanced way, to be able to develop some consensus about what that good means. And it may, in fact, precipitate a sea change in the way we treat each other, and that we harness these tools of such great capability for those things that we hold dear and that we hold to be of value.